Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense, and today we have an infectious diseases video. We'll talk about mucormycosis, aka the black fungus. Look at this! That's an escar. It's a black necrotic tissue in my face. With that said, now let's get started. As you know, microbes are either bacteria, fungi, viruses, or parasites. But technically, parasite has a different science. It's not microbiology. It is parasitology. Why different? Because many parasites are macroscopic, not microscopic. Case in point, Ascaris lumbricoids. So the science is called microbiology. It has bacteriology, fungology, or mycology to study fungi, virology, and parasitology. Let's talk about fungi. We have two types of fungi. Mold, aka hyphae, looks like that, has hyphae, has some spores, etc. Or it could be yeast, all right. But some fungi are both mold and yeast. We call them dimorphic. Morpho means shape, and di means two. I have two shapes at once. If the weather is cold, I will be mold. But if the weather is beast, I will be yeast. So we call it mold in the cold, yeast in the beast. So I can imagine that all fungi were talking to the dimorphic fungi. And all of the fungi said, uh, Would you like to be a hyphae or a yeast? Uh, the dimorphic answered, Yes, how about both? We're mold in the cold, we're yeast in the beast. Can you give me an example of these dimorphic fungi? Sure, we have histoplasmosis, blastomycosis, coccidioidemycosis, and paracoccidioidemycosis. And these were discussed in my playlist called Pulmonology in a great video known as Lung Infections. And this is a good shot summarizing histo, blasto, and coccidioide. These three are dimorphic fungi. Today's topic is mucormycosis, the black fungus. Why do we call it mucor? That's the name of the disease. Why myc? That's the fungus. Fungus. Myco means fungus, and osis means condition. That's why the name of my channel is Medicosis Perfectionalis. It's a condition of perfect medicine. All right, mucor or mucor and rhizobus. Let's describe the fungus. Is it dimorphic? No, it's not dimorphic. It's only mold. Oh, so you mean it's only hyphae. That's right. Describe the hyphae. White angled or obtuse angled. Okay, and they are broad. Non septate. What the flip is that? A septa is like this. So here is the part of the hyphae. This is septated. Oh, it has septa in it. Septa is the plural of septum. But these do not have septa. We call them non septate and they are irregular have hazard. How does this fungus infect me? All right, let's suppose that we're talking about Adam, and Adam is immunocompromised. Adam will inhale one of these spores of the fungus, mucor, or rhizobus. Now the spores enter through my nose, okay? And now they are in my nose. They will start invading and proliferating in the wall of the blood vessel. And as you know, your nose has gazillion blood vessels. That's why sometimes you bleed from your nose, and it's not fun. After they erode and destroy the blood vessel, they will start eroding and eating into a bone right here at the roof of your nose. What's the name of that bone? The ethmoid bone. Part of it is called the cribriform plate. What does cribriform mean? Perforated. Oh, it has holes in it. Oh, so the fungus will just keep going up. What's above your nose? Your brain. That's why ancient Egyptians, during mummification, right after you die, if you would like to go in a pyramid, they have to mummify you, okay? But your brain is mushy, mushy, squishy tissue. It will rot in and it will destroy the whole process of mummification. Therefore, they used to introduce a probe through your nose and into your brain. And like a straw, they will <laughs> suck your brain out of your body so that you do not rot. And I hereby declare the mummification process a success. You want another example? Okay, let's say that someone punched me in the nose, and it was a very bad, bad punch. The nose is part of the face, of course, and this is called the dangerous triangle of the face. Why? Because this is related to the brain, and it's also related to the cavernous sinus. Behind there's a cavernous sinus. If the trauma, and therefore inflammation and infection, went to the cavernous sinus, this can lead to a cavernous sinus thrombosis, which is ugly. You might think, oh, I'll just give the patient some antibiotics and everything is gonna be hunky-dory. Shut up. It's a terrible condition. So let me tell you the story again. Adam is immunocompromised. Adam inhaled the spores. The fungus started eroding and destroying the blood vessel wall. Number four, the fungus has passed from the nose to the brain. How? Through the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. Number five, the fungus will make a cause a brain abscess usually in the frontal lobe. Why frontal? 
because this is the part of the brain that is above the nose, doofus. The abscess could be in the frontal lobe of the brain, and of course it could be abscess in the nose. All right, if we have abscess in the nose and abscess in the frontal lobe of the brain, what would you get? Oh, headache and facial pain, no kidding. Anything that happens inside your brain, it will cause headache. Why is that? Because your brain, according to the Monroe-Kelly hypothesis, is a box that is 100% packed and stacked. There is not a single empty inch in your brain. Everything is packed to the fullest. Therefore, if an abscess grows, it will start pushing on the surrounding areas because there is no space, and this will raise the intracranial pressure. And when the intracranial pressure rises, it will press on other structures, causing headache. Next, this infection can spread into the cavernous sinus, and this is really, really terrible because the cavernous sinus has many cranial nerves inside of it, and that's why the next point is cranial nerve involvement. All right, in the face, what could I get? I could get this. What is that? Necrotic black tissue in the face. What do you call this? A scar. Where can the scar be seen? It could be seen in the face, we call it facial, or it could be seen in the palate. Oh, what's the palate? It's the roof of the mouth, between the mouth cavity and the nasal cavity. Oh, it's here, oh, of course. So you, not just you look at the patient, you ask the patient, hey, hey, Adam, open your mouth and look at the roof. Oh, it's necrotic. That's an scar on the palate. So Adam was immunocompromised, but why? What suppressed my immunity? It could be diabetic ketoacidosis, happens with type 1 diabetes, uncontrolled diabetes mellitus, it could be neutropenia, which is decreased neutrophils in my blood. And leukemia can lead to neutropenia. Why? Because leukemia is usually increased, let's say, lymphocytes. So your bone marrow is busy making gazillion lymphocytes like crazy. Okay, what's going to happen? You will make lots of lymphocytes. Oh, but you will take resources from neutrophils. Oh, because I'm busy making lymphocytes. Or I'm busy making monocytes or basophils, or eosinophils, so of course, neutropenia will occur. If my white blood cells are toast, my army is toast. I cannot fight foreign invaders, such as mucormycosis, the black fungus. Or I could be suffering from immunodeficiency, and this could be inherited. I was born with it, such as Britain agammaglobulinemia, aka X-linked agammaglobulinemia, SCID, which is severe combined immunodeficiency, or Wiskut aldrich syndrome. Or it could be acquired immunodeficiency, which can be physiological, such as pregnancy. Mommy is normally immunosuppressed. Why? To protect the baby, because the baby is foreign to her body. If mommy's immunity was robust during pregnancy, she will attack the baby, immunologically speaking, and the baby might die. Pathological acquired immunodeficiency include acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Or it could be, uh, I'm taking immunosuppressant medications such as what? Corticosteroids, methotrexate, rituximab, or cyclosporin. What's an SCAR? Black necrotic tissue. How do you treat an SCAR? Escarotomy. Oh, it's a surgical procedure. You remove the SCAR. You cut it out. You cut the necrotic tissue out. Be careful. There is a huge difference between SCAR and SCAR. SCAR is just fibrosis. Oh, because when your body's trying to heal, it can heal beautifully, leaving no SCAR, or it can heal with fibrosis and leave a SCAR. Which one of these two conditions requires surgery right now, otherwise the patient can die? A SCAR, of course. How about SCAR? No, it does not need surgery. Only cosmetically if you want it. But you can live with a scar, it's not gonna kill you. Question, why do we see mucormycosis cases after the freaking virus? Well, I don't have all the answers, but let me give you my opinion. Let's say I have weak immunity. Now, I am more vulnerable to get exacerbation because of the virus, and I'm also more vulnerable to get mucormycosis. Moreover, let's say I had uncontrolled diabetes, or I had diabetic ketoacidosis, or hyperosmolar non-ketotic hyperglycemic syndrome. This can increase my risk of mucormycosis because my immunity is weak. Let's say I'm taking immunosuppressants. And don't forget, if I have severe case of COVID and I am hospitalized, the doctor might give me steroids, which can help me with this, but can weaken my immunity. There are no solutions in life. There are only trade-offs. Why do we hear about it in India? Now, I am not omniscient, and this is speculation. Number one, population effect. Imagine that we have two countries. Country A has a total population of 1 million. 
and India, which is about 1.4 billion. And let's assume that myocore mycosis will affect 0.01% of the population. Country A, you will have 100 cases. No one will notice, even doctors will not notice, of course, unless they are reading the annual reports. But in India, you will get 140,000 cases of myocore mycosis. Second, many patients don't know that they are diabetic. And because India has a bigger population, you will find more cases. Third, fungi in general love warm, humid weather. Mucor mycosis aside, let's say that someone developed a fungal infection, tinea for example. Which part of their body is most likely to be vulnerable? You can get the arm pit, you can get the groin area, under the female breast, the intergluteal cleft, especially if I'm morbidly obese, because fungus loves warm, humid weather. How can we treat mycosis surgically and medically? Surgically, surgical debridement known as escarotomy, medical treatment and antifungal medication such as amphotericin B and isavuconazole, which is an antifungal. Don't forget, there are no solutions in life, there are only trade-offs. Let's review mucor and rhizobus from Ficmanic. All right, mucor and rhizobus. Here is mucus for mucor and the rhino for rhizobus. It's a fungus. That's a fungus right there. With some irregular non-septate hyphae. And they branch at wide angles. You are vulnerable if you have leukemia. Here is Luke. Ketoacidosis with increased glucose. So here's the keto glue. You get abscess in the rhino, which means no, so rhino abscess and cerebral abscess. It penetrates the crib reform plate, here's the crib, which has a brain, and it leaves black necrotic iscar on the face. The means of learning are abundant, it's the desire to learn that is scarce. So please master your craft, because patients need you. If you like this video, you will love my antibiotics course. Learn about antibacterials, antivirals, antifungals, and antiparasitic medications with 40 videos, 70 questions, 35 cases, my perfectionist ultimate notebook, and a mind map. Go to medicosisperfectionist.com and download it today. Microbes aren't going away anytime soon, so please learn how to kick them in the butt. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my courses. Go to Picmonic for animated medical mnemonics. Thank you for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.